smartphone apps can certainly come in handy while you're traveling. But could a new one help you join the fight against wildlife trafficking next time you're on holiday? This week, I'll be finding out how your holiday snaps could help protect endangered species like this little fellow. Oh wow, well you're looking pretty good for 50 sunshine. We're in Cape Town where Afrikaans rock is lending a new rhythm to one of the city's suburbs. Global guru Simon Calder plans a whirlwind trip through some of Europe's most historic locations. And we're up close with Malaysia's marine life, trying to capture the perfect underwater photograph. Sometimes it's better to shoot up, so you're going to be looking at the nice blue water. Hello and welcome to The Travel Show, this week coming from Sydney. It's one of the world's most iconic cities, and it's also home to the Taronga Zoo, one of the biggest attractions for tourists. Situated just across the water from the Sydney Opera House, the 98-year-old Taronga Zoo is home to hundreds of species of animals. For the people here, this place offers a chance for an encounter with an exotic creature. But for some, animals like these represent big business. The trade in rare animals and products has long posed a threat to endangered species, but the past decade has seen a surge in illegal wildlife trafficking. According to a recent report by the European Commission, poaching of some iconic species has reached unprecedented levels. In 2013, over a thousand rhinos were poached in South Africa alone, up from just 13 in 2007. Much of this activity is carried out by well-organised criminal networks and the recent increase in activity has been largely driven by rising demand. Rhinoceros horn, for instance, now fetches a higher price than gold. Governments and international agencies are devoting hundreds of millions of dollars to combat the problem. In Malaysia and Hong Kong, large holes of ivory have been publicly destroyed to discourage the trade. Here at Taronga Zoo, efforts are underway to bring a new army of recruits into the fight against trafficking, tourists. The zoo has launched a world-first free app, created in concert with the wildlife trade monitoring network, Traffic, which allows people travelling abroad to report on suspected illegal activity. Wildlife crime hotlines are in regions all around the world, but they're in different languages, they use different phone numbers, and it's really hard to know who to report to, as, especially as a tourist when you're travelling around. So we thought, why not use the technology that's available these days, get smartphones and turn them into wildlife trade reporting tools. You just hit make a report. Tourists who see suspected wildlife crimes, yeah, yeah. such as rare animals in a cage at a market or products like ivory being sold, can take a photo with their phone and upload it via the app. Then the information will be reviewed and referred to local enforcement agencies. Is there a chance that a traveller could get themselves in trouble or put themselves in danger by making a report against a poacher or trafficker? We're not asking travellers to take risks in reporting the app. We, we put a section in the app that gives lots of tips and suggestions on staying safe while making a report. As long as people are sensible and discreet, um, just take your phone out when and if it's safe to do so and make a report. If you need to, you can make a report when you get back to your hotel later that night. A prime example of how tourist involvement can make a difference is happily clambering around his enclosure in the zoo. This is Mr Hobbs, a sun bear who was spotted caged up at a restaurant in Cambodia in the mid-1990s. He was destined to become an ingredient in the local delicacy bear paw soup, but a travelling Australian businessman made a report to a bear protection agency and he was rescued. I cannot express my gratitude and just 
overwhelming sense of thanks, I suppose, to the businessmen who did rescue Mr Hobbs because every time I, I see Mr Hobbs and look at him, it, it gives me goosebumps and I'm actually getting them right now, just thinking about what was actually going to happen to him. That it's not a unique case, it's um, something that is happening to a lot of bears over, over in Southeast Asia. So a happy ending for, for the beautiful bear here, but um, it just goes to show, you know, this one businessman made a difference for, for this animal's life. Given how unique they are, it's perhaps not surprising that Australian animals are a target for traffickers of wildlife across the world. The country's reptiles, such as these blue-tongued lizards, are prized as pets across the world and have been smuggled out of the country in the post in passenger luggage or, in one 2011 case, discovered at Australian Customs in Perth, stuffed into teddy bears. Hello there. Hi. Hi, I'm Australia's bird life is also at risk. A black cockatoo like this one can fetch up to $20,000 on the illegal market. And how old is he? Oh, he's close to 50. He's the old man of the bird show. Oh, wow. Well, you're looking pretty good for 50, Sunshine. Trading animal products to be used for souvenirs is also a problem and the wildlife monitors at traffic say tourists can help prevent this by thoroughly checking the origins of what they buy. Tourists can be really part of the solution for some of these environmental challenges. But on the other hand, uh, um, unthinking consumption, uh, buying the wrong things, can certainly be part of the problem. And certainly it may seem like you're just buying one item, I'm not the one causing the problem, it's the, it's the organised criminals. But actually that adds up the more people who are involved. So yeah, it, it can also be part of the problem. Tackling international wildlife trafficking is an enormous task, but the makers of this app hope a simple snap on a tourist's camera phone could help ensure the future of these incredible animals. If you want to find out some more about animal conservation around the world, here are some travel show tips. The giant panda is iconic in the world of wildlife protection, and it's native to China. Chengdu's giant panda base is home to around 100 of the bears and also runs a research and breeding program. They're most active in the morning, so if you're heading there, set your alarm early. If you're a fan of birds, head to Scotland to see the white-tailed eagles of Mull. The UK's largest bird of prey became extinct in the country during the 20th century but sanctuaries have helped with their reintroduction. The Filipino tarsia is the world's oldest mammal and it's thought that only a few hundred remain. They're extremely shy creatures and don't survive well in captivity, but a sanctuary forest on the island of Bohol offers day and night treks where you might get lucky and see one. You have to keep your eyes wide open though, at only 16 centimetres in height, Tarsiers are also considered to be the world's smallest primate. Finally, you don't have to go out into the wilderness to support conservation efforts. Many zoos also carry out projects to protect endangered species. And if you prefer a wild night to a night in the wild, Zoo Lates, taking place in London and Edinburgh during the summer months, offer evening entertainment including live music, face painting and talks from the zookeepers. Now for a bit of music. It might not be your first stop on your trip to Cape Town, but one of its more unglamorous suburbs is making a name for itself as a breeding ground for rock bands. We sent Raj along to the place that now calls itself Belleville Rock City. Welcome to a world known as Zeph, popularised by this rap trio, De Antford. Once a demeaning term, now a number of groups have gathered under the Zeph banner, shaping a new identity for the younger Afrikaans-speaking generation. like these high school mates in the four-piece Van Coke cartel. We just play rock and roll. Yeah. Um, the only reason why we connected to Zef is because we come from Belleville originally. 
So it might be in the way I speak, even just the way I speak English, you know, with a more kind of flat Afrikaans, um, what's your word? Accent. Accent, yeah. People yeah. will go, oh, you know, that will all be related to that. We used to call that kind of people with uh, mullets and, you know, driving old cars, not because of, of, of a style, because mm -hmm. they couldn't afford anything else. I mean, we used to talk about those people are quite zen. The result is authentic Afrikaans rock which Van Koch Cartel says rebels against the monotony of suburbia and the baggage of their history. And now, somewhat unbelievably, rock fans come from all over the country to pay homage to what they call Belleville Rock City. Nice. Ultimately, like so much about South Africa today, this is all about an evolving sense of identity, where being African first is the key. Where do you feel that you fit in? Is it, is it now everyone's country in the sense? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's everyone's country. I think um, for us being Afrikaner, uh, I, I actually never really liked that term just because of the history with the name. I would rather um, call myself an Afrikaans-speaking South African, you know? You've got the job. A new player. Cheers, I'm out of here. I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> Next, your weekly update from the world of travel. First, a reminder that your phone and laptop are going to need to be charged before you head to the airport if you're off to the States or to the UK in the near future. Tighter security measures mean devices that won't switch on may not be allowed onto the aircraft. It's after new fears that terrorists are looking for fresh ways to attack passenger planes. Hundreds of people saw the Channel Tunnel from a different perspective this week, when a power fault brought their train to a halt under the sea. Nearly 400 passengers were on board the stranded Eurotunnel shuttle service, which had to be evacuated. The delay meant six-hour waits for passengers at stations in London, Kent and Calais. go if you want to see some really top-end yodeling. Well, you could do worse than heading to the National Yodeling Festival in Switzerland. 180,000 people turned up to this year's event in Davos to take in all manner of singing, flag throwing and alphorn blowing. Here's an interesting yodeling fact, it was invented by alpine shepherds as a way of communicating over long distances in the mountains. Still to come on The Travel Show. Joe Inwood's in Malaysia for an underwater photo shoot. We're going to be calmly approaching a subject and once we're in position, carefully taking a picture without scaring the fish away. So see you after the break. The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Welcome to the slice of the show that tries to make your travelling life easier. Let's start with Thomas Kebede from Ethiopia, who's been invited to Europe this summer by a friend in Sweden. The plan is to spend two weeks in Europe, Stockholm being the main destination. Can you please advise a possible itinerary? My main factors here are budget and my preference for historic places. 
Thomas, what a great opportunity. I've been poring over maps and come up with an itinerary that follows as straight a line as possible through the heart of European history. Start in Rome, Ethiopia's air gateway to Europe and the heartland of the continent's civilization. Head north to Venice, which is even more beautiful than the images suggest, then over the Alps to Salzburg, a musical crucible protected by mountains. Prague is the best example of a middle European capital unscathed by war. Then cross into Poland and make your way to Gdansk, a historic port which is also where the Solidarity Movement began that led to the fall of the Iron Curtain. And finally you can relax aboard the 19 hour ferry ride to the Swedish capital. Next, Steve Holbrook is off to Bermuda. I've just found out that in Bermuda travellers checks are no longer accepted. I'm looking to take a prepaid travel card, but no one seems to be able to tell me if these will be accepted readily. Can you help? Happily, I can, Steve, since I've been there recently complete with a prepaid travel money card. First, a reminder that even though Bermuda is as British as anywhere on the planet, the currency is tied to the US dollar at parity, and indeed there's plenty of American cash in circulation. Like many places, Bermuda has moved away from accepting traveller's checks because, although they were valuable in the last century, this millennium they seem positively archaic. The 21st century enhancement is the prepaid travel money card, even more secure because it's pin protected, easy to replace and able to be topped up online. And yes, you can use it in the many ATM cash machines in Bermuda. Just make sure you load it well. The Atlantic Archipelago is beautiful and fascinating, but also one of the most expensive places I've ever been. Graham Hewitt is planning an adventurous visit to northeast Europe and wants to know... I'm flying into Helsinki and then taking a train from Helsinki to Moscow via St Petersburg. Do I need to purchase a visa for Russia before I travel? Graham, you certainly do need a visa in advance. For several years, the Russian authorities have been hinting about a visa on arrival scheme, but they won't give me any indication when it might happen. Find a specialist agent who can help you organise a visa and find you somewhere to stay in Russia's beautiful former capital, St Petersburg, and the current capital, Moscow. Once you've got your papers in order, the travel itself is straightforward. There are four express trains a day from Helsinki to St Petersburg, taking under four hours. That's all for now, but if you've got a travel question, from budget flights to luxury hotels, I'm here to help. Just email thetravelshow at bbc.com or tweet at BBC Travel Show and I'll do my best to help you. From me, Simon Calder, bye for now and see you next time. To end this week, we're heading to the northeastern coast of Malaysia, known for its tropical islands and vibrant coral reefs. We sent Joe inward to try and get a close-up of the marine life that lies beneath the surface of the water. A holiday on Malaysia's Bahentian Islands is undoubtedly one you'll want to remember, and most likely capture, but with some of the world's best diving. Many of the most memorable moments and encounters will actually take place below the waves. And getting them on film is not as easy as you may think. Your subject was maybe a fish or a nice piece of coal. And Dave Powell should know. He's been traveling the world, taking underwater photographs for years. And today will be teaching me the art. Often divers come back after a dive, thinking that they've captured something beautiful, uh, only to review the photos and be disappointed that they've ended up with what essentially is a, a blue mess. The first job is making sure the camera is safe from the water. An aluminium case does the job. When we close the door, we shut this. This keeps the water out. Then I'm ready to go. For my trip, I'll be using full scuba gear and a top-of-the-range compact camera but you don't need high-end equipment to take good photos. You don't have to be a diver, you can just be a snorkeler. A waterproof compact camera that is maybe a couple of hundred pounds will give you great results. We're heading out to a dive site just north of Pula Besar, the larger of Malaysia's Pahentian Islands. Although I can already dive, the 
first thing I notice is that as soon as I try and hold a camera in the water, even the basics seem to become a challenge. When you're scuba diving, you want to maintain a nice neutral buoyancy. You don't want to be floating up and you don't want to be sinking so that you're going to crash into the bottom. Which is what I seem to spend most of my time doing. So Dave takes me back to basics. Stay calm. Use your breathing to maintain buoyancy. Now that's under control, I've got a chance on getting the right angle for a perfect shot. We'll be shooting either horizontally, like this, to give us a nice depth uh, with a nice blue background, or sometimes it's better to shoot up, so you're going to be looking at the nice blue water. We won't be shooting down. Say if this was a fish, you don't want to be taking a photo of it like that, because it's never going to be distanced from the background and it creates a very messy image. As we practice in the distance, a shark. Keep cool, keep still, and the black tip might approach. Unfortunately, I decided to chase it. Turns out the shark is quicker than me, and my photo won't be winning any prizes at all. Most people's reaction is to swim after it as fast as possible before it swims away. This just makes fish swim away quicker. So we're going to be calmly approaching a subject and once we're in position, carefully taking a picture without scaring the fish away. Gradually, I get the hang of it. Clownfish never leave their anemones. Even I can't get this one wrong, right? The final and most important thing I need to remember is to protect the reef. So we'll all, we always, always, always put the reef first and photography second. Yeah? As we will be getting quite low to shoot up and we don't want to injure yourself or the reef. Dave keeps an eye on me to make sure my fins don't crash into the precious and fragile reef. Being close enough to the coral to take a good photo while keeping my unwieldy equipment and limbs away from the seabed is difficult. Finally, the sort of encounter I've been waiting for. A huge shoal of yellow-tailed snapper, and hopefully, a photo to be proud of. After a couple of days diving, I might not be up there with the professionals, but I think some of our shots do capture the true beauty of this underwater world. Well, that's it for this week. Join us next time when we'll be sending Damien McGuinness to Poland to find out why some tourists are vandalising Auschwitz, the world's most infamous former Nazi concentration camp. When you have a, a wall like that, the, the easiest thing is just to write your name that you were there. But in fact, people who do it, they destroy the authentic building. That's next week. In the meantime, don't forget you can keep up with us while we're out on the road in real time by checking out our website and social media feeds. Details are on the screen now. But for now, from me, Krista Larwood, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Sydney, it's goodbye.